What we have to do is learn how to fight spiritual battles. That is fought through praying in the Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Gospel Truth. We appreciate you watching. Uh, tonight we are going to talk about uh, praying in the Spirit, or AKA praying in other tongues. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in our last video. Right. <clears throat> We've hinted at it for a couple of videos before that too, but we actually did talk about it. Yeah. For the first time. Uh, we got some questions about it, so I thought it might be a good night to discuss what it is, uh, why it's for today, and the benefit to the body of Christ. The first scripture that I wanted to read was uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. And that says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Yeah. So, we are a spirit. God is a spirit. Uh, the Bible says that God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. What we do as Christians far too often, and when I say we, I mean... Just you. <laughs> no. I mean me. Yeah, me um, We fight the good fight of faith in our might and power. But we are waging spiritual battles. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, which talks about... For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against uh, spiritual wickedness in high places, against the rulers of darkness in this world, right? We, we fight spiritual battles, but we're fighting them in might and power, right? So what we have to do is learn how to fight spiritual battles. That is fought through praying in the Spirit. If you woke up tomorrow morning and you saw a news article in the newspaper, if you still read a newspaper, yeah, or if you I think you're the last person to yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if you picked up Twitter and you read that the United States overnight had gone to war and that uh, the President of the United States, in sending his troops to war, told them that they weren't allowed to use any of their weapons. They weren't allowed to use their body armor. They were just supposed to go over there and fight whatever. We would think, my God, that's the craziest thing we've ever heard. Why would the president send his troops over there, or a general or whoever, I'm using the president in this particular as the commander in chief, but why would a general send his troops to battle if he loved them, and take away all their weapons and take away all their armor. Right. Or if he wanted them to win. That's right. <laughs> yeah. We do that every day when we face the enemy, the, uh, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places, the principalities, all those that uh, Paul talks about in Ephesians 6.13. We do that every day if we're not fighting them spiritually. We're fighting right. them without our weapons. Which okay. is crazy. The major problem that has existed throughout the bulk of the history of the church, and we like to say body of Christ rather than church, and the reason is people can talk about the church and don't mean Christianity at all. They mean some hierarchical organization. And it's good to have organization. We should all have an organization together. There shouldn't be a fractured body. The There shouldn't be trillions of denominations and things like that but you know that is where we are but the reason we don't use church is because of because of that fracturing we we talk about the body of Christ because there is no fracturing we're all members of the body of Christ that's right and if we look at it that way that's a better way but the problem is throughout history the body of Christ has was fed lies of religion that said we don't want, we don't need the things of the spirit anymore we need to 
because we have the Word of God, we need to face the battles just with the Word of God. And we do need the Word of God. But we First have, and foremost. Yeah, really. absolutely. Well, the, the Spirit was never going to say anything that's against the Word of God. That's the Holy right. Ghost never will. The, it can't because if you really want to break it down, the Holy Ghost, God the Father, and God the Son, they're all one. God the Son is the Word. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the Word of God. So that's what, that's what John tells us, and that's what we believe. So it, it'd be impossible for God to argue against himself. So it's not going to be any kind of um, fighting between that. And the Word is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That is our major offensive weapon. But it's the sword of the Spirit. The, the Word is made alive by the Spirit that tells us what the Word really is for. It's that revelation inside of us, and that's been pulled away from us for thousands of years. I, I watched a documentary recently on who wrote the New Testament, and I would encourage anybody, it was on Amazon Prime, it was a good documentary. It was natural, right? It was a natural um, telling of history of how the New Testament came together. And what they said was, <clears throat> when they got to Paul's letters, they absolutely attribute Paul to X amount of his letters. And then they say, these other letters, Ephesians and Colossians, are the two letters specifically they use. These, these particular letters may not have been written by Paul because they sound different than his other letters. See, that what they don't take into account is that Ephesians and Colossians are the two spiritual letters, right? So Romans and Corinthians and Thessalonians, Thessalonians was pretty spiritual, talking about the future, but uh, Romans and Corinthians and Galatians, Paul is talking to a church about some natural and spiritual things. But Ephesians and Colossians, it's all spirit. We're the body of Christ. We've been raised up to, to sit with Christ. We were crucified with him. We died with him. He raised us. We were raised with him. They were all spiritual. So it seemed to these guys that Paul, somebody else might have written those letters. He, they didn't. It was Paul spiritually writing these letters, right? Okay. So there is a natural side to things. And there is a spiritual side to things. What happened in the, in the early church is that man got involved from a natural standpoint and could not understand the, the purpose behind praying in the Spirit. And so what they did was remove it because anything that, is, that we don't understand, we fear. It's a, it's a natural reaction to fear something that you don't understand. So the purpose of this video is to help your understanding, your natural understanding of what's happening spiritually so that the benefit, God, the weapon that God gave you to fight the enemy, spiritually speaking, is praying in the Spirit. That's the weapon. That's the body armor. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. He's saying just take it. So it's already given to you. Okay, Take unto you the whole armor of God. Now keep in mind, Ephesians is a spiritual letter. So he's talking spiritually. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day or a day that th th something bad happens. Is what this means. When you got to face the bad guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and, and having on. So these belong to you, right? These have already, all of these, the, the armor and the weapons have already been given to you. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. How many? All of the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The very next verse is praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. What he's saying is, I've given you this armor, so put it on and pray in the Spirit. 
That's what he says. Right. That's what he says. When you're, he starts out with, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. Here's all this armor. Here's this weapon. You need to fight him. So put it on and pray in the spirit. That's what he says. So what what is actually praying in the spirit, I guess, is part of the question. What is? So one of the problems with... <laughs> wooey Christianity is that they, they grabbed a hold of, and this is the end of the charismatic movement and probably before that as well, really tongues started coming back into the United States starting around the time of the Azusa Street Revival. William Seymour was instrumental in that. You should look it up, but uh, it actually, there were some places throughout history before that. I think it actually started in Kansas in the U.S. But it's, it's the revivals that go along with it. Well, when man gets a hold of it, they see, oh, there's this new thing. There's this praying in this language you don't understand with weird words. It became a showpiece mm. rather than... It the became same like, thing happened in uh, Corinth. Yeah. That's what Paul's telling the Corinthians. That's exactly what it's telling. So they're like, hey, look what I can do. And, and making sounds to accomplish what that that's the point is not the point of praying in tongues the point of praying in the spirit and they are synonymous the point of praying in tongues is not so you can say look at me look what i can do it is to pray out mysteries it's to pray out things that you can't comprehend yet with your natural mind because you don't have that information and you don't know the exact way to pray it says the holy ghost helps us to pray uh, when we're praying in the Spirit, He helps us to pray in ways we don't know how to pray. It's praying out the perfect plan of God. That is the purpose of praying in the Spirit. And part of the perfect plan of God is revelation to you of what the Word actually means when it, when it says what it says. There is a gigantic difference between reading and understanding what the words in the Bible say and actually having revelation, which is the word revelation is like heart knowledge, really knowing down in, on the inside that what the word says is true and how to operate in that, how to, how to wield the sword of the spirit, how to wear the breastplate of righteousness. All that is, re, all, the praying in the spirit is required to understand and to unify that armor. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, likewise the spirit also helps our infirmities, is what it says, but that word means weakness. Likewise, the Spirit helps our weaknesses. Where we are weak, He is strong. That's the whole point, right? right. So, likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities or our weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He that searches the heart, being the Holy Ghost, makes intercession for us. He helps us pray, is what that is. So, if I sit down to pray, I, I know to pray for me, for my family, for uh, my church, Timothy tells us to pray for those that are in, that have the rule over us. Yeah. Uh, so I know I can pray for that. I can pray for um, my pastors, my friends, my family. It's all these things that I know about. Right. Right. So I know about all these things that I pray for. And the Bible clearly says, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue... My spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So I, I don't know what I'm praying about. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So Paul is not making... Uh, he's not telling you to just pray in the Spirit no. all the time. It's not what he's no, saying. No, 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 no. You pray with your understanding. What I know, I will pray about. I pray that, that uh, I think, really, prayer is sending up thanksgiving to God, right? For what he's blessed me with, for what I have, for his favor, for his, for all the things that I have, my healing, all this, I'm thanking him for it. Uh, and then I pray for my family, for my friends, for my pastors, for my church, 
all these things, I can go down the list and pray for them. Then I get to a point where I don't have anything else to pray for because I don't know anything else. That's when praying in the Spirit, the Spirit Himself uses you to pray for things that you don't know what you're praying for, right? I pray in an unknown tongue. My prayer, I'm praying to God. Yeah. God's helping me pray for what He needs me to pray for. Not what I'm thinking about. Not what I'm thinking of praying for. Because that is limited. Not bad, just limited. I only know so much to pray for. Right? There's a whole lot more that God needs me to pray for. So... By praying in the Spirit, God uses me to pray. Uses me in the sense that He he makes intercession for us with my prayers. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things over the years that I've heard. Reasons for why people reject praying in tongues. Okay? Number one, it's weird. Number one, it's weird. Okay. <laughs> but I'll go back. That that is they they think it's weird because they don't understand the purpose. Exactly. You fear things that you don't understand, right? So the first thing I will say is this is not a requirement. Right? You can be saved. They're two separate things. It's best if they go together, but you can be born again and have an eternity in heaven with Jesus just like us. Right. When you are born again, you get the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You have the yeah, yeah, Holy yeah. Spirit. It's, it's not some secret event or some different thing you get involved with. You, you get the same Holy yes. Ghost at the, at the same time, but there's a big difference. There's a big difference because you don't have the weapons that God gives you to fight in the evil day in this life. There are no evil days on that, in that life. No, there are, there are no obstacles in that life. There are no uh, tests and trials when we get to heaven. The tests and the trials and the evil day and the, the, the need for the weapons is now in this life. He gave you the weapon to fight today in this life, yeah. to overcome. I say fight. I really should say overcome. Second Timothy 1, 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. The verse before that is Paul tells Timothy to stir up the gift that is within him. That word gift is charisma, right? That's the same word used in Corinthians for the spirit. What Paul is saying there, if you, if you uh, break that verse down, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, before he tells him that God hasn't given him a spirit of fear, what he says is, fan into flame the gift yes. that is within you. Yes. Stir it up. Pray in the Spirit. And then God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. In other words, what he's telling Timothy is, before you go out and minister to these people, Stir up that gift because God's not giving you a spirit of fear. In other words, be bold. This stirring up the gift makes you bold. Okay, so here's the other thing yeah. you should know is Paul is talking to these churches. This is the early church. Paul's talking to these people as if they know exactly what he's talking about. Right. When he talks about praying in the spirit, when I pray uh, in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, my understanding's of He's talking to these churches as if they know exactly what he's talking about. This wasn't foreign to them. No. The first church praying in tongues was not foreign to them. As a matter of fact, in, in Corinthians, here's one of the, the, the other, uh, outside of it being weird, here's one of the other um, uh, objections that I have heard for people giving reasons they don't pray in tongues. And that it was, uh, it's either for the early church, which... If you believe it's for the early church and not for today, then you got to scratch out the whole Bible. Because we're using the Bible today. <laughs> I mean, you just got to er right. erase that. A, I mean, lot that. Of, a lot of people hinge on the one verse, after the perfect has come, you don't need tongues anymore. 
we're not That's, in the perfect. Yeah, we're not perfect. It's not the it's not the Bible that counts as the perfect because it was already there. We'll be before. perfect when yeah. he comes. When it's we're... not until then. So that's a dumb cop out yeah. that people have used because they don't want to explore the things of the spirit and go into them. That's right. So don't be dumb. So Paul th- there is a a private gift for just you. And then there is a public gift for the church. Which, when he talks about, I would rather you uh, say uh, five words in English than X amount of words in tongues. And, uh, and, and it's because the Corinthians were going to church and they were just praying in tongues. And that benefits nobody in a church service because nobody knows what you're saying. That's what he was saying. And then he went on to say, I speak in tongues more than all of you put together. Right. So, so he wasn't saying don't do he's it. He's not saying don't do it. He's saying this context isn't where you do that. That's right. He's talking about in a church service how if you're going to pray in tongues, uh, pray for a, an interpreter. Or really, if you're going to pray in tongues in your private life, pray for the interpretation of what the tongue is. Right. right. But in a church service, if you're going to have someone stand up and pray in tongues, you should have an interpreter there so that the church benefits, not just you. Okay, so so he he's distinguishing between a private gift and a public gift. Okay, that's what Corinthians is. It's everywhere else, and even in Corinthians he talks about the private gift. But it's everywhere else that he's talking to these people as if they know exactly what he's talking about. They know exactly what he means. They they're they're not abusing or misusing the gift. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let the word of Christ, that's the Bible. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. When he's talking about I, I I pray with the, I pray in the spirit and I pray in my understanding. I sing in the spirit. I sing with my understanding. That's that's a singing in tongues. Yeah. That's exactly what he's talking about. You can do both and you should do both. So number one reason for why you should uh, want to pray in the spirit is Ephesians chapter six, because that is how you fight spiritual battles. Right. We don't pick up weapons of war in ourselves. And I'm not saying we shouldn't our country shouldn't defend itself and blah, blah, blah. I'm saying personally, we shouldn't we shouldn't use we fight spiritual battles. Are the weapon. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. That's right. But against these powers, and principalities, rulers of darkness. And that's exactly right. So you pray in the spirit. Yeah. You, you take on you take the word, the words first. You take the word and you take on uh, truth. And integrity, which is the you know your loins girt about with truth, uh, the helmet of salvation. So being born again is a prerequisite for praying in the Spirit, right? So uh, you, you take all these things: faith in that it works, the belief that it works, and you pray in the Spirit. That's how you fight spiritual battles. On the other hand, uh, you can go to Jude chapter. Verse 20, there's only one chapter. Jude the chapter, yep. verse 20. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Okay? So your most holy faith is praying in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. It's faith in the fact that what you're praying is talking to God directly, right? Build yourself up. On your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. That word building is um, the, the connotation is building the temple or building the house or fortifying the foundation of a house. So that's your body. You build your body up naturally, your natural body, you build it up by praying in the Holy Ghost. Okay, praying in the spirit, praying in tongues, as he said, they're all synonymous. So not only do you fight spiritual battles. So now we're talking about why you should want to. Right. Right. Not only do you fight all of your spiritual battles that way, 
You also can fight natural battles that way in your body, not, uh, not outward natural battles, inward natural battles, right? So your praying in the Spirit builds up your own body. That should be enough, spiritually and naturally in your life, that should be enough to make you want to It pray. makes you into a supernatural force for God, yeah. as opposed to a natural force for God. You are supernaturally born again, but you are limited to just the natural prayer if yeah. that's all you know, if that's all you do. And you don't have the ability to accomplish the, the plan and purpose of God that's beyond mm. anything you can comprehend in your own mind. It actually makes you supernatural, like a superhero in God's kingdom, in the, in the plan of God. It's impossible to do without praying in tongues. You can accomplish great things for God with it, without it. There are people that have. But to accomplish the supernatural things, you need this. I can pray naturally for all of the things that I understand, but I don't know what happens tomorrow. So if you want to pray for anything in the natural right now, one of the great things to pray for is Kanye West. He's a child of God who just found God this what, February, something like that, earlier this year, he became a Christian and he's put on this tour and he's, you know, he's got a lot of understanding to grow into, but he is boldly going after the things of God right now, which is wild from where people think he's been. I think he's been kind of a true original the entire time and thought his own way, but pray for this man because he's going to be facing, and he already is, facing spiritual battles trying to stop him from pursuing the things of God. And he is a voice to a generation right now. So Christians are the most judgy people on earth. We, we segregate ourselves, Christians, segregate ourselves into these buckets of denominations. <laughs> and I know more than this guy, and that guy's not using that verse correctly, and that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And, we, we, you know, you can see that by reading our comments. <laughs> uh, support Christians. Okay? They may not have everything right. Neither do you. Neither that, do we. We don't either. No, it doesn't work that way. Just support God. If somebody is putting his career on the line to support God, whether you think it's genuine or not, and I could be talking about Kanye, or I could be talking about a lot of people, right? Putting their lives on the line to support God, the last thing they need is some judgment from another Christian. I mean, that, that is, that's beyond me. Right. It doesn't matter if you don't like his music. I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. You can, you can like, but support him, right. right? Because he's putting something out there that a lot of people are afraid to do. <laughs> Most people are afraid to, wouldn't do because of the persecution. So if you're not going through daily persecution, you, and I mean us too, then maybe you're not putting it all on the line for God. So um, it is you that prays. This is not some uh, weird, far out uh The Holy Ghost doesn't take over. The Holy Spirit doesn't take over and get inside you and you start to do anything. Forcing, yeah, yeah. He doesn't, you, you decide when you want to pray or if you ever want to pray. I know people that have been filled with the Spirit uh, my entire life that never pray in tongues, okay? Because they decide to or not to, okay? Right. They, they may pray at church on Sunday morning if the whole congregation, but they never do it at the week because they decide, right? God is not a, uh, He's not going to push you to do anything. No. He wants you to accept the gift that He has given you and use it. But it's up to you whether you use it. That's really God's, that's really what God does with everything, right? He's given you healing. It's up to you to accept it. He's given you uh, prosperity or favor. I, I, I don't like that word prosperity. He's given you it's, favor. Prosperity is like the church. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a word that's been co-opted into give me money and you'll, you'll yeah, succeed. Yeah, yeah. And that's not what it means. That's he's not... given you favor. Yeah. Right? His favor. It's up to you whether you believe it or not. He's given you praying in the Spirit. It's up to you whether you believe it or not. It's the belief that we fight spiritual battles and we need spiritual tools to fight them. Yeah. We win when we have the spiritual tools. When we use the spiritual tools, we win every time. Yeah. The fiery darts of the wicked that all of are that are all quenched with the shield of faith. There's a fiery dart coming for me tomorrow. I don't know what that dart is. 
I only know what I dealt with today. I don't know what darts are coming tomorrow. That's why you pray in the Spirit, because you don't know what you're praying about. But you know you're talking to God Almighty, and you know that you're using the tool that He gave you to fight the spiritual side and to build yourself up. Amen. So, here's, here's the point. You should pray in tongues, and if you are in the mem- if you are a member of the body of Christ, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost and pray in tongues. How do you do that? It doesn't do us any good if we just talk about it and don't actually go through the process. Mm-hmm. It is not a difficult thing whatsoever. God's not gonna like if you just hold your mouth open. Uh, God's not gonna jump in and magically come into your mouth and make noises for you. You do you simply say. Thank you, God. I'm a child of God. You say, Holy Ghost, I yield myself to you. Come fill me with your spirit. And as you, you say, I believe I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. It's the same thing as Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10 about salvation. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is the same way. You just, you just believe and confess and say that I am. And then you open your mouth, not just hold it open, but you start out with some syllables, some words. It's, it's not a difficult thing to do, but God's not going to make your mouth move for you. Divorce yourself of any kind of language you know. Don't just say, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. And you start speaking out with syllables that are different than what you, were, you would be doing before. And you believe God to take hold together with you, and you will see this language start out and then begin to develop uh, beyond that. Some people are, have like a fluency right away, and some people have a couple of words. It, it's not a big deal one way or the other, but continue to develop towards it. The now, word tongue in the Bible is a dialect, right? We speak in the English tongue. Uh, someone might speak in the Spanish tongue, right? It's a dialect. Same thing here. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a language. Right. And it's a spiritual language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, some, the other, one of the other arguments people will say about tongues is in Acts chapter two, after they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoken tongues, Peter and all the disciples mm, that go out and they start that. speaking in tongues. And it says that everybody heard them in their own language. Everybody who gathered in Jerusalem, this was the time of year when people, when Jews from all over the world came to Jerusalem, they heard them in their own language. They didn't just speak um, Hebrew. It doesn't say, and, and Peter spoke in German and the German people heard it. It said the people heard in their own language. Right. So it's qu- quite possible, I think probable, I think this is the way it happened, that the Holy Ghost spoke through these people and they heard it. They were interpreting tongues, really, is what was going on at that same time. They were hearing it in their own language. Up here, it won't make any sense, right? Because it's not, yeah, it's not with your Because God is a spirit, and they that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth, okay? So you, it won't make any sense up here. Nothing with God will make sense up here. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense that uh, God sent a spiritual being to earth to be born of a virgin, to then grow up, be hanged on a cross, and then him raised him from the dead so that all of mankind be saved. Okay? That doesn't make sense. And yet no. we, sit, we tend to have no problems accepting right. that. Right. Right. But when it comes to tongues, all of a sudden we're like, I draw the line. <laughs> that I don't understand. And it's because you're required to do something other than just believe. Okay. The first thing is believing. If you believe that God gave you a tool in uh, a tongue, a dialect, to, to pray to him, right? To we're just, just he hears what you're saying. Then uh, you sit down and you say, Father, I believe it. Okay? And what you will start, you'll, that you'll start to, um, the word here is the wrong, but you, the, the Holy Ghost inside of you, if you're a born-again believer, body of Christ, the Holy Ghost inside of you will start to, you, you will 
um, you'll you'll start to it comes up from here, right? Not from here. It doesn't filter down from your brain. It comes up from here, right? But you have to speak it out. Right. And I don't know that that makes any sense. I, I, I'm going to use the phrase here, okay? But you're not going to hear it. So, dis, so just in air quotes, I'm going to use, you'll hear the, the tongue, right? You, you'll hear, the, he talked about using a syllable. You, you'll hear it. Right. Almost, right. but you'll sense it almost, right? It's the Holy Ghost inside of you that you are giving place to, is right. what it is. And I'll say, he grew up in an environment where tongues was around all the time. Yeah, I didn't. I grew up. I grew up denominational, like a lot of y'all out there. Now I can tell you, he's right. But I can tell you, almost my well, entire natural-born life, I didn't pray yeah. in tongues. Well, and I want to because say, I didn't get the benefit. Yeah, of it. I was going to say the environment was there, yeah, and yeah, it yeah. wasn't there for me. But the answer is the same. We both had to go for um, under the understanding ourselves to get a hold of that ourselves. I got filled with the Holy Ghost, and I didn't understand it, and I just avoided tongues mostly, you know, here and there, until one day I finally said, "I'm going to get this for real," and I spent a few hours. I was driving from Pennsylvania to North Carolina, and I spent a few hours just praying in tongues, and it was two, two and a half, three hours in, and got nothing, got nothing, got nothing, got nothing, and then finally made an actual spiritual connection mm -hmm. to that. So even if you get filled, and, 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 and I don't know, and it's been different ever since. I've been, it's been an amazing thing, vital, important to my life. Where I am in life, I can attribute mostly to praying in tongues. The revelation that has come to me through praying in tongues has led me in a direction that I really like. Even science will say, they did a study, the scientific term for praying in tongues is called glossolalia, okay? They actually have a scientific term for it because they did studies on people who prayed in tongues. Scientists would hook uh, the uh, nodes, the sensors up to one's brain while they were praying in tongues. And what they found was the language center of the brain, the activity center, where language goes dormant. It almost went to sleep, right? Because it's not up here. No. And I'll post the link to the, to the uh, scientific discovery there if that helps anybody, right? It helped me yeah. to know uh, that it was a spiritual thing, not just a natural thing that uh, someone could blah, blah, blah in their, uh, uh, from their head, right? It helped me to know that scientifically speaking, um, scientists looked at it and, and found that the brain basically goes to sleep right. if someone's actually praying in other tongues. Right. Your understanding literally is unfruitful. That's right. So, all that being said, you should get filled with the Holy Ghost and pray in tongues. Yeah. And find a church that can help you. Yeah. Right? Find a church that will help you. Find people. There are... Yeah. It, it's the... It is... From what I understand, the fastest growing segment of Christianity in the world is people who are part of spirit-filled, tongue-talking churches. Yeah, um, because so those are there. churches that are uh, there. There's some meaning behind it. It's mm -hmm. not just the vapid, um, motivational church that you see. The mega churches, and, I, and I'm not downing them, right? I, th there's a place for them, but what they have become is like a motivational seminar every Sunday, a lot of them. Some of them not, right? Uh, some of them I, I actually can listen to and like, but uh, there has to be meaning somewhere, meaning in people's, real meaning in people's lives. There does. Yeah. We really appreciate you turning in, tuning in, sticking around for this. Um, and please, please like, subscribe, share, comment below. We do read the comments. We try to respond to them sometimes a little more quickly than others. Most of the time it's the first two or three days we hop. We're pretty good about answering. And then after that, we're right. So really jump, jump on them. Right. <laughs> we'll get, we'll get better, but we really yeah. do appreciate it. If you could, you know, share it with your friends, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, if you watch this a few yeah. times, tell us what you think. I think people need the revelation that's in this video. Yeah. Thank you.